Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Without further ado, let's get to the topic. Um, so the issue of Palestine is something that is near and dear to Muslims all around the world and human beings of conscience and people who strive for peace and justice as well. I kind of want to dwell on a few issues here when we talk about the importance of Palestine. And then I want to get to the uh, Zionist myths that are um, utilized and uh, used in propaganda as well that attempt to smear people who try and support the Palestinian cause and also cause some doubt as well and confusion in people who are supporting the Palestinian cause. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to flow with uh, for today. For the first part, which is um, why is Palestine so important? I want to talk on it on two levels. I want to talk it from a faith level and I want to talk about it from a more human general moral level. Even though there are a lot of people who aren't Muslim with us today, I do want to highlight this aspect of the faith issue uh, because it helps to alleviate a lot of confusion as well about the region, why people find it so important, um, why is it considered a holy land, and why do Muslims, even though they have nothing to do with Palestine in terms of their, uh, their racial uh, origin or their ethnic origin or their family or anything like this, they've never even been to Palestine, maybe even never met a Palestinian, but they still care so deeply all around the world, over 2 billion Muslims. Um, so with this, we have to understand that, number one, when it comes to the issue of Palestine or this area, uh, we understand that historically this area was a bastion of historical monotheism. So this idea of the oneness of God, uh, which was a radical idea in its time, uh, particularly when you go back to Abraham and, and, and those prophets, kind of two, 3,000 BCE, this movement of monotheism uh, that started with Abraham, you might call it the Abrahamic movement, uh, was really centered around this region. And that region of Palestine was an area that was seen as very important. It was seen as the promised land. It was seen as a land of blessings from a theological point of view. And those who hold the scriptures dear, revelations uh, from the Jewish faith as well as the Christian faith and the Muslim faith, all see this as historically significant as well as theologically significant as well. The thing that where it becomes very important from a Muslim point of view is that you find historically, uh, and this will help us understand as well some of the Zionist myths about this as well. Historically, that land was inhabited by you know the indigenous people that were there for thousands of years, the Canaanites and so many other different groups as well uh, that were there, and they engaged with a lot of the uh, with the um, uh, with the, the the nation of Israel, the children of Israel that came through. There were wars and there were battles and these sorts of things and different kingdoms that would come up and would come down. But what we found was that actually, if you look at the ethnic origin of the Palestinians that are living there now, you find that you have Canaanite DNA and genetic evidence that these are actually descendants of those very ancient indigenous people well before you know the, the children of Israel, were have, the historical children of Israel were have to, would have come to that region. After that as well, we find, of course, that after a few hundred years in which they were there, you have the Babylonians, you have the Romans, uh, and essentially uh, in about the 7th century, you have the Muslims who actually take control of this land. And during this time, you had all of the Abrahamic faiths, the Christians, the Jewish, and the Muslim people all lived there with their religious freedoms, no issues, no tensions. And this continued for thousands of years minus 100 years uh, with the Crusader invasion and what happened there. But after, again, it was uh, taken back again in the uh, 1100s and the 12th century. Then all the way up until we get into the 20th century, it was under Muslim rule. And that region and that area was always a place where Jewish people, Christian people, Muslim people could all come and they could all worship and enjoy the theological significance of that land and the historical significance of that land as well. There was no problem. There was no constant warfare. And this, you can say, is myth number one when it comes to a lot of the Zionist propaganda where they say that, oh, this land has, oh, people have always been fighting over this land for thousands of years. That's simply not true. You find that, as I said, the brief moment with the Crusaders in the 11th century. And before that, you're looking at about 13 to 1400 years of harmony in that region. 
very little tension, no religious tension. And you'll find the Palestinians that are there, the Christian Palestinians and the Muslim Palestinians, they all live together and they lived together before and they continue to live together, supporting each other as well. There were also Jewish Palestinians as well that were there in the region uh, as well. Uh, and so this is an important myth to completely bust, uh, which is that this was not something that we found was tumultuous. You know, up until very recently, the last you know 100 years or so is where you started to see a lot of the issues and problems start to arise. Now, when, um, and so this is, you can say, the importance from the faith point of view. Muslims feel a huge sense of, uh, you can say, pain and sorrow at the loss of this land, not because of some territory, but because of the meaning and significance behind it. That this was a land that's meant for the worship of God. And it's meant to embody the values and ideals and principles of this Abrahamic way, Abrahamic morality of loving your neighbor, of loving God, of being good to creation, of being merciful and being compassionate, embodying all of these very important ideals and values. That is what Palestine is meant to stand for. That is the force of Jerusalem in this world. You can say the Jerusalem movement or the Jerusalem force of all these prophets that were sent were to preach the love of God and the love of his creation all around. And the fact that it has now been warped and twisted in the last hundred years to become a place of occupation, a place of uh, illegal settlement, a place of oppression, is something that's deeply hurting to the Muslim community, which is why you find Muslims in particular find this issue very confronting and very near and dear to their hearts, even though they might not have any particular ties to it from an ethnic point of view. And even though this is not purely a Muslim space, it was not like, oh, before, you know, 100 years ago, it was only Muslims and then, you know, uh, uh, Israel formed and these sorts of things. No, this was always from the beginning, from the beginning, it was always a multi-faith and a multi-ethnic area where people lived in harmony and there was no problems or tensions there. From its very beginning in, under the Muslim rule, like I said, under Umar al-Khattab, which is in the 7th century, we're talking so early, we're talking thousand, more than a thousand years ago, all the way up until now, to continue that kind of multi-faith aspect that was there. Uh, and so this, deeply, this is uh, deeply uh, troubling, obviously, to Muslims, and our hearts bleed when we see what it has become. This place of great theological significance has turned into this. Uh, and so that's the, you can say, the faith layer. Uh, and so this is something that I want to remind my Muslim brothers and sisters that are there. As for the brothers and sisters that are here, you know, as allies to us as well, who might not share a Muslim faith, there's a second layer there in terms of the importance. And it's a more broad layer of the importance of the Palestinian issue. And that is the moral layer. And this is something that you don't need to care or even know about any of the history of Palestine to get on board with what's happening here in terms of the moral movement, in terms of the political aspect of this issue right now, where you see that over a hundred years, and I say more than a hundred, even though many people will say 75 years and, and, and these sorts of things of occupation, certainly that was when we found the birth of Israel in 1948, but the, the settling into that land of Palestine actually started in the late 1900s, in the early 1900s, and continued and continued and continued up until we saw uh, 1948 uh, and the creation of the uh, Israel state, as well as the Nakba, the great catastrophe, where 700,000 Palestinians were completely displaced, ethnically cleansed from that region. So there is this moral element there of a people, an indigenous people, that were living their life, that had a rich history. Does this ring any bells? This is something so similar to what happened with the struggle of our indigenous brothers and sisters uh, right here in Australia as well. You have even further history here. You have almost 50,000 years of a rich culture, of living off the land, of knowledge, of all these sorts of things that were there that of course were taken away uh, because people simply just wanted to take the land and thought of the people as less than human. And that's the important point. When the early Australian settlers, early European settlers came to Australia, they also saw the indigenous people as subhuman. They would use even religious justification to say, these people are not even having a soul. These people are not even human. We see the same language being used to the Palestinians as well. Multiple people from the army and military profession, from the army and military generals and commanders, too, as well, you'll find the um, 
uh, just the general uh, population as well. You have politicians as well who keep voicing the same trope of dehumanization where they call them subhuman or animals or human animals. And this dehumanization of an indigenous people is something that we see. It's the same, uh, it's the same strategy out of the colonial uh, playbook that we saw in our history and we've saw in multiple histories and we're seeing it right in front of us. You see, many of us read about all the horrible things that happened to the indigenous people in Australia, in New Zealand, in Canada, in America, but, and in the Americas, not in America, South America, but we seldom are able to witness it before our eyes. We are now witnessing almost as if we're going back in time and the exact same scenario is playing out right in front of our eyes. And it's such a shame that we find that people and politicians who seem to care so deeply, and I, I say that term very uh, lightly and with, uh, with, with quotation marks wrapped around it, uh, about uh, the, the, you know, the indigenous cause here, is seemingly blind and is unable to make the very basic human analogy to the suffering that is happening to the Palestinian people. Who are the indigenous people of the land? No doubt. And I said, even biologically, physiologically, we see the evidence that they were there and descendants of the very pre-ancient Canaanites that were there thousands and thousands of years uh, before anyone else came to that land. So this moral element is something that is also something that uh, you'll find many people will rally around the Palestinian cause because this issue of colonialism, this issue of the effects and the negative effects of what it has on the population is something that many people are come to understand over the years, especially with our histories uh, as people living in the West, as people living in these uh, lands that were once settled as well. This has come to our conscience. And so we are now seeing this. And this is the way, why Palestine is very unique, because we are seeing what we care so deeply about right in front of our eyes. And that is why I believe that we have found that this, we are in a point that is very historic. We are in a point in the Palestine-Israel issue that is unprecedented. I remember when I was growing up, most people had no idea about this uh, issue. Most people would just swiftly, heuristically, just side with Israel because that was the media narrative and there was no other counter narrative that was being presented. Anyone who had a different opinion on the issue was completely shut down and there was no clear support for the Palestinian cause. Over the last few decades, we have started to see more awareness of this issue. We've started to see as well from social media and from the ease of being able to take videos and being able to, uh, to share pictures and these sorts of things. We've been able to spread awareness about this and we are seeing unprecedented numbers of support for the Palestinian cause. And I think everyone in this auditorium, and especially when you're in some of the major cities as well, you are seeing numbers of pro across the world Every single major city, those are the record numbers for the amount of people that come for protesting. The, uh, the, the narrative and public opinion that you see online as well is completely shifting. You are seeing so many people come out and voicing their concerns for the Palestinian people. And this is something that is so heartening to see, but it's not just something that you might think, oh, who cares if we think about it differently? They're still struggling about it on the ground and it doesn't seem to be making a difference. It is making a difference. It is making a difference. And so this is a point I want to share with everyone here that you might think, oh, I'm all the way up in Darwin. I'm in the top end. Well, what am I going to do in terms of trying to mobilize and actually make any practical difference in this issue? I'm here to tell you that every single one of your voices is being heard and your voices online and your voices on social media beating the algorithm. There are people who are seeing pro-Palestinian content that have never seen it before because you're beating the algorithm, because of all the support that people are giving and all the time that people are giving all around the world, it is collectively shifting the narrative and shifting the public opinion such that 
uh, the, 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 the Israeli army is not able to fully act without impunity as it was able to for 75 years. Now the microscope is on them. And this is one of the things that's unprecedented. They're not used to all of the pushback, the major pushback that they're not used to getting from the world. Yes, there was some pushback, especially in 2014 with the most recent bombing of Gaza. That was for 50 days, by the way. I believe we're on day 38 to 37. 50 days of continuous bombing of Gaza, but even now our, the death toll is much more than it was in 2014. But they're not used to this pressure. The pressure towards the Americans as well, who is obviously the chief supporters and those complicit in the war crimes that are being done against the Palestinian people. We are seeing the tide is changing and the pressure is being mounted upon them. And they are seeing this as their last chance. And this is what I firmly believe, that this is it. This is their last chance to wipe Palestine off the face of this earth because they know after this, there's no going back. After this, whatever is left, and if there is a Palestine left, it will almost be incumbent from the entire international community that they are finally given their sovereign state and that freedom will finally give in to the Palestinian people. And that is what they are afraid of. And that is why you see them acting out of sheer desperation. And in their desperation, they are losing their position and status in the international community. They're losing their position and status in the UN. They're losing the moral high ground. They're losing the perception from the world towards both Israel and America. And they are feeling this pressure. So every protest you go to, everything that you share on social media, realize that it is having a direct impact and realize that you are part of this global resistance movement that is trying to put an end on the illegal occupation, trying to put an end on the blockade of Gaza, and now trying to put an end on the impending genocide at the most, and at the very least, the ethnic cleansing of the people of Gaza in that small 42 kilometer diameter by six kilometer region. Imagine how small this area is 2.2 million people that are there. And of course, they've now been cornered and displaced further down into the South. And so this is the moral element that is so important for us and for anyone, whether they're Muslim or, or Palestinian or European or from Africa or from you know Asia, whatever it may be, wherever we may come from, from Australia, wherever we come from, this is an issue that us as human beings, because we all share this, and this is a, a belief of Muslims, we have this thing inside of us. It's called the fitrah. This is our belief as Muslims. Every human being, regardless of where they are born, they share this. It's called fitrah in Arabic. They share this innate disposition. They share this collective consciousness, you can say. This collective consciousness that includes morality. It includes spirituality. It includes other things as well of how we think and these sorts of things. Such that we all have shared morals we all have shared ideals when we see a child that's being bombed we all feel that pain we don't have to explain to each other why that's wrong we collectively just know we have the same conscious in this regard this is the fitra this is the power of that fitra that unites humanity together under this shared understanding of our morality and the shared understanding of what we should be seeking for in this world and what we should be looking for in Palestine. And so this is that second layer I mentioned. The first one was the faith layer. The second one now is the moral layer. Now, I will conclude with uh, three main myths that we see uh, being pushed by Zionist propaganda regarding the Palestinian issue that you might have heard of before. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the responses to these as well, but just so that we're all on the same page here, especially because what the call for action here is we need to start being pro, not start, we need to continue because this is already what's happening. We need to continue raising awareness. We need to continue telling our friends and family, our coworkers, the, our, 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 our fellow students that are at the university here, whatever it may be, we need to educate people about this and why it matters. Because the first thing that people say is, and this is the first thing, it's not a Zionist myth, but you can say it's the lazy kind of uh, thing inside of us in front of many people. Oh, this place is so far away. 
oh, the whole world, there's poverty everywhere, there's war everywhere, this issue, we shouldn't care about it. We're in Australia, it's a thousand kilometers away from us. Number one response to this, of course, is why I mentioned earlier that this is close to home, which is why you find indigenous brothers and sisters support the cause of Palestine, because what is happening there is exactly what happened here. And if you claim to be a person that cares about the oppression of colonialism, then you should care, of course, about what's happening in Palestine and Israel, because it is one of the few cases that we see literally in front of our eyes, still living a remnant of history centuries past, an archaic way in which people used to politically organize is in front of us in 4K all over the internet. And we are witnessing it. And those things that we thought in my mind, I used to always think, how is it that people could actually call the Aboriginal people subhuman or animals? I said, how ridiculous is this? How could this even be allowed to be spread around? And then you see the videos of the people there calling the Palestinians animals and nobody is saying anything about it. They're calling them subhuman and nobody's caring about it. And so this is something that's a very important point. The second myth is the issue of, this is what they'll say, Palestine never existed, existed as a state. There was the Ottoman Empire when that fell, the British took control after World War I, and then the British gave the state to Israel. That is what they say, and this is a complete lie, a complete lie. Firstly, of course, Palestine as a region existed even in the time of the Ottoman Empire. That's point number one. Point number two, when the Ottoman Empire fell after World War I, there was that region, Transjordan, that region that was actually called the Mandate of Palestine. And if you go to the Balfour Declaration in 1917, you find that because there was the issue of anti-Semitism in Europe at this time. So you can look at these two trajectories. You have Palestine and the Palestinian people post-World War I, and they are essentially trying to make their state, like Jordan has their state, Syria had their state, Iraq had their state. It was carved up after World War I by the Allies. And so Palestine was part of that. Now, as this is happening in Europe, you have these poor Jewish people because of the anti-Semitism that was rampant in that region, they were being displaced from one country to another country, to another country, to another country over hundreds of years. And so this movement and this thought of Zionism came forward. Theodor Herzl was the founder of modern Zionism that we see here today. And he said that the only permanent solution for the anti-Semitism in Europe is for the Jewish people to have their own homeland and they're able to then live amongst themselves and they will not be under the thumb and the oppression of the European anti-Semitism. And initially he actually envisioned, you know where he envisioned? Argentina, that was meant to be the home of the Jewish state. And there was thoughts, talks of Kenya as well. There was all these different places. He himself was an atheist. He wasn't uh, an actual religious Jewish person, but obviously ethnically, he felt a connection to the people and wanted to help the cause. Now, fast forward. The eyes on the prize was, of course, Palestine, because historically, this is something significant to them. And so Britain said, OK, that's fine. We can establish, and this was in 1917, a Jewish homeland. But when you read, and it's actually available, just type in the Barclor De Declaration, 1917, Balfour Declaration, 1917, you will find, it says very clearly, a Jewish homeland in Palestine. That was always the intent. And it also said in this letter, alongside and not affecting the self-determination of the people that are living in Palestine. The vision that was there from the British government and the Zionist lobby and the Zionist organization was that they were going to be immigrants to a land called Palestine. And that area would be far from European anti-Semitism because they understood that this was a multi-faith an interfaith place from before, and the Jewish people had hardly felt, uh, experienced any anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. Things here and there you'll find, but if you compare it to the European history, there's no comparison. Now, what happened is that from 1900s to 1948, increased immigration, increased settling, 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 but you found this sense of this is our land and we want it all to be ours. You have these militias that are formed by the Zionists, the Hagana, which then turned to the Irgun. These terrorist organizations, by the way, 
uh, who blew up a British uh, hotel that assassinated multiple people from the UN. This is not, this is a clear uh, terrorist organization from history. They would harass and kill and they would beat and, 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 and abuse the indigenous people as they came and would settle the land, even though it was not theirs. And it was never meant to be theirs. It was meant to be Palestine. You know, I had uh, actually had the uh, honor of visiting uh, Palestine and Israel as well in, in Jerusalem and as well going to the West Bank. And I found in the um, archives of Masjid al-Aqsa, the Aqsa compound uh, in the basement, you have all of it, it's still there. And, and it's crazy because obviously of what's happening there, you have all these British uh, government documents all the way up to 1948. And they would write the tax revenues and everything like this, of all the stuff that the British would collect, of course, because it was good for, it, 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 you know, it was interesting as well. The moment that the book started to show that British was actually at a loss because they were making lots of money from obviously colonizing Palestine, from collecting all the taxes. And they would also put in money as well. And you started to see that that money started to turn and it actually turned into net negative. But every single time the report up until 1948, it clearly said Palestine. So this notion that Palestine didn't exist is completely false. Britain and everyone recognized that this was the Palestine state. And even when Britain colonized it, they recognized that they were colonizing Palestine. So Palestine always existed. That's number one. Number two myth is Palestine rejected the call for statehood in 1948. You have to think about this. You have the whole land. It's called Palestine. In, in the mid-May 1948, the Nakba, the catastrophe, where you have Deir Yassin, which is this massacre of the Palestinian people that continued in this wave of these militias and these uh, Zionist militias that came and pushed 700,000 Palestinians out. Then they declared, we are a state. No one recognized them because they said, this is not how you found a state. In 1948, this is not how you found a state. The only group that recognized them the next day, the only country was America. No one else recognized them. Then after that, the UN had an emergency meeting and they came up with their resolution, which you saw the majority, and I wish I had the maps here in 1948, the majority of the land was given to Israel and a minority of it was left for Palestine. And at this point, this is what they rejected, that this cutting of the pie is not fair. They are the majority. They were people that were just forced from their lands. It's not fair that they're getting all of this land and whatnot. And so it was initially then rejected. So you have to understand the context. It wasn't that they didn't want a. Um, it wasn't that they didn't want a um, uh, uh, a state. Uh, it was that they didn't want a state that was divided in such an unjust way. In any case, as you move forward, 1967. Of course, there's constant conflict and. Uh, you know, uh, after this as well, the Urgun had assassinated one of the UN members, and then all of a sudden the UN, uh, uh, you know, uh, recognizes Israel at that point, and the state of Israel is born in this uh, very gruesome way. 1967, of course, we have the other UN resolution in regards to the div division, again, much worse as well. And so each time the Palestinians are getting the short end of the stick, and then finally, at this stage that we're in at the moment, where the Palestinians are saying enough is enough, because from 1948 up until now, their land was occupied, continued to be settled upon, continued to be abused, all these sorts of things, completely um, you know, oppressed, living in an apartheid regime as well. And you have the almost a million, more than a million now of Palestinians in diaspora as well. Now you have all Palestinians, all Palestinians that are there who are ready to accept the two-state solution, who are ready to accept Israel, and a Palestinian state as well. But what we're finding is the Zionist organization that is currently in Israeli office, the far right government of Netanyahu is not interested in peace and is not interested in having a sovereign Palestinian state. And that is the only thing that is very clear here. You'll find even voices from Israel that are starting to understand about the harsh treatment towards the Palestinian people. And they themselves want the Palestinians to have their own land because they recognize it's in the best interest of their own safety, that they don't oppress so, so horrendously a group of people just literally 20 kilometers away. This is not in their interest, in their, in their national security interest either. And so this is something that we find uh, is, 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 is very clear from the far-right government that is now in power 
is that their only interest is to destroy and wipe out the Palestinians. They've said it and they've made it very clear. The media will not pick up the soundbite. Nobody will focus on this aspect, but it is very clear. You'll find all the interviews. The statement is the same and it is, it is consistent. Almost every military general, their goal right now is not about fighting a very particular you know, terrorist organization or anything like that. It's very clear. They want to wipe up Gaza from the map and they want all those Gazan people to leave and to go into diaspora and they want that area to be ethnically cleansed. And so this is the clear goal. But of course, that is what they think will happen because they think that they're powerful and mighty. They think they have the mightiest ally, but they don't realize and they're undermining and underestimating the will of the people and the will of the people like yourselves here today in Darwin, Northern Territories, Australia, coming on a Saturday night, filling up an auditorium from all walks of life to come and hear about this Palestinian issue. They have underestimated the will of the people and they now realize the pressure that's mounting upon them and they are now scared and they are in desperation and they don't know what to do. And so they are acting in all different ways, but soon, and I believe this with conviction and I believe this as a Muslim and as a believer, and I believe this as well deep in my soul. And I'm sure we all feel this belief that Palestine will be free, inshallah, God willing. We will witness the free Palestine at the end of this very dark tunnel, at the end of this very dark time, we will see the light very soon. We will see the light of a free Palestine. I believe this sincerely. Thank you very much.